So, Miss Malia, our Hawaiian word for our first watch was puhi, puhi for the eel. Do you have an idea what we should, what our next one should be for this watch? Yeah, let's see what comes up, what is yeah. revealed by Kanaloa. Yep. And then we can uh, use that word for the rest of our watch, yeah? <laughs> Sounds great. Um, I'm always going to be looking forward to that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure our viewers are excited too. You get to learn new Hawaiian words, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now that we're settled in a little bit, I think it would be nice for us to introduce ourselves and for something we can share. Um, I'd like to know if anyone speaks any other languages or if you've ever like studied another language. So, hi everyone, my name is Tori Hunt. I am the Science Communication Fellow sitting in on the 4 to 8 watch and I am a high school science teacher from North Carolina. And I studied Spanish in high school um, and like towards the end of my senior year, I felt like I got pretty comfortable. I was like watching a lot of movies in Spanish and listening to a lot of music in Spanish to help me get comfortable and then I just stopped practicing. So I need to get back into it. But I've been really enjoying learning so many Hawaiian words um, and I've been trying to practice my Spanish out here a little bit too. Malia, what about you? Yeah, so um, aloha, my name is Malia Evans. Um, I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for Papahanao Mokoakea Marine National Monument. And um, I studied Olelo Hawaii um, in college. Um, I also have a, I love Japanese language, so that's mm -hmm. another um, area of study that I'd like to kind of dive deeper um, because I'm, I'm very fascinated by um, Japanese culture. Um, so I'm not, you know, my language skills are not, you know, that great, but there's always room for improvement. Yeah, I want someone out for Jason. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And also share too, like I've been on Duolingo. I had like about a 130 day streak before I came out here for Hawaiian. Um, and then I like lost track of time and definitely forgot to keep going. Um, but it's been really nice to just be out here surrounded by language that has really helped a lot, especially with like my speaking and just being comfortable trying to say new words. Mm -hmm. And I think on board we have multiple languages yeah. that are spoken. So it's so cool. Mike, what about you? Uh, yeah, Mike Brennan, uh, maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. I'm the co-lead scientist for this expedition. Um, I took Latin in high school and a little bit in college, but uh, functionally I've forgotten most of that, and I don't speak any other languages. Have you ever been there? To Latin? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Rome. <laughs> I've been to Vatican City where they officially speak Latin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure you that. She says, contrarum verum est. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I am part of the science team as a geologist. And I, this is my first Nautilus cruise. And I am a grad student from California State University, Long Beach. And I studied Spanish, elementary, middle, and high school up to my sophomore year. And um, I got to the point where I was like reading Spanish books, but um, after that, I, I didn't take any more language classes because I decided to take science classes instead. Um, and then in college, I only needed to take one semester of a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I might as well like pick something fun. So I picked Italian. And that was really, I had so much fun in that class. <laughs> I loved it. I loved all the little, we would have like, we would go through the textbook and of course like the textbook would have like videos with it and the Italian videos, there was just so much drama happening and it, it was so much fun. That class was fantastic and my teacher spoke Italian the whole time for like just an intro class and it was so nice to be so fo focused on pronunciation because we would have a lot of verbal quizzes which I didn't have a lot of like in, in Spanish in high school. so. I was really, really bummed when I couldn't continue my Italian journey, Italian journey in college because of all the course load of yeah. the science major. So, yeah, that was my my language stuff. 
So. I love that. Do you ever still practice any Italian or like? I watch or Italian movies? TV shows, <laughs> like soap operas. I love that. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> nice. Sebastian, what about you? Um, I took one semester of community college ASL. Oh. Mm. Oh. It was definitely not a good experience. <laughs> oh. oh. I get, <laughs> all I can describe is that it was a trap um, because we walked in and the instructor for the first like three weeks never spoke a word. Oh my God. And he was a very, very emotive signer and seemed very nice as a signer. Mm -hmm. But then he stopped after three weeks and when he started talking, we realized he wasn't such a nice person. Oh. <laughs> um, like, yeah. Can you go back to signing? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he was very um, rude as a spoken person. And uh, literally it was the first grade I ever got below a B plus because I was taking this as a running start class in high school, which means I was taking uh, college credit in high school at Pro Community College. And it's kind of funny because I, ha I have a deaf aunt, mm -hmm. and I talked to her after that, and I'm like, do you know this guy? Is he in the deaf community? And she's like, oh, yeah, everybody hates that guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, um, that was the only language I really ever attempted to do. Um, I wasn't required to take any languages in my high school. Mm. Well, I'm sorry you had that experience. I think I'm going to try heading more that way. Okay. So, what are you thinking? 325. 325? Right. What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Seems like that's the kind of the... I don't want to overshoot this ridge oh, okay. and then fall yeah. down this way. Yeah. All right, I think that's good. Coming okay. up on the saddle. Mm -hmm. Ridge okay. nav. Sebastian, have you ever been to a concert in the Pacific Northwest we where they have Lori Abrams five. as the sign language interpreter? I have not. Oh, man. Same speed, thank you. She's fantastic. She tours with like the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead and all that. And interprets not just lyrics, but also music. Mm -hmm. You almost have to see to believe. I know, so there's like a lot of sign interpreters and like concerts I've seen on like Instagram and whatnot that really get into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, good for them. No, it's yeah, so exciting I saw, watching um, them. I saw a woman signing an Eminem uh, concert and keeping up with him. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. Anyone on front row ready for an introduction? Okay. Sure. My name's Jake Bonney. I'm piloting ROV Hercules, and I know the English language. <laughs> <laughs> I took a semester of Chinese in college. It did not go well. I struggled <laughs> with the characters. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. I, I always struggled with language growing up as well. It was one of my worst subjects. Thank you for sharing, Jake. Yep. This is Derek Sowers. Uh, I'm a navigator on this watch. Um, and I, I took Spanish in high school, but haven't really pursued anything since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tito Colacious over here piloting Atalanta. I grew up in a uh, household full of Norwegian immigrants. My parents came over in the 50s, and English was the first language, but Norwegian was the second. I picked up quite a few words, but never got conversational until I started spending time in Norway. Anytime I'm over there for three or four weeks, I get conversational, but that's about it. That's really that's cool. cool. Yeah, oh, that's super that cool. That is so cool. I want to go to Norway so bad. Could have had a career with Kongsberg. <laughs> Still could. Is this a puhi? Yeah. Was that to say a puhi? Puhi. Or a rat tail? This is a puhi for puhi? sure. Uh, nice. Ed, what about you? Uh, I'm Edit Video. Um, I, start, I think I was mentioned this earlier. I studied Spanish in high school, which I really I'm not good at, but I really it lets me. Uh, oh, that was so close. Um, you know, it lets me. Uh, connect with people and as an avid traveler uh, you know I go out of my way to learn the whatever it is the five to ten 
absolute words you should know anywhere you travel. Hello, goodbye, yes, no, please, thank you, good, bad. Um, so I could I could roll those off in a bunch of languages, but I think just trying to, uh, especially with technology now, mm -hmm. uh, not let language be a barrier to interacting with people from other places and learning about their cultures. Yeah, I'll say I have um, a lot of students who uh, come to our school and for some of them it may be like one of their first years or first couple of years living in the United States. So they're English language learners and like I've had a class where I had students in there that spoke like Spanish and Arabic. Um, and I feel like comfortable enough with Spanish where I can like read <laughs> it and like understand or like if they're speaking to me in Spanish I can kind of understand but uh, with Arabic I really knew nothing. But it was like always really special to see students uh, like English language learners converse with each other in their different languages just like on Google Translate talking and like just all the connections that have happened um, and how technology has made it so easy. I'll have to teach how to say hello in Arabic later. Um, Appreciate that. I, I understand that being new to a country and not being fluent in the language is a challenge. Mm -hmm. However, my life would have been so much easier if my parents didn't speak the same language as my teachers and I had to interpret. You said it would have been easier? Oh yeah. The teacher says he's not working very hard and he's not applying himself. I could have told my parents, they say everything's great and I'm doing well. Oh wow. That would have been awesome. <laughs> we have an app now called Parent Square that we use and when we send our messages home it'll auto translate. <laughs> Oh. So. oh man, oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, Kim and Get I got that. stranded. Uh, I think it was during a transit strike in Paris, and used uh, a translate app to converse with uh, two uh, older women on the street who were able to get us on our way. Mm -hmm. So thank you, translation technologies. So this is kind of in the saddle. It's a little steeper than I expected. I agree. Are we looking for rocks here? Uh, not quite. We We're going to get to the end of the saddle and start to where there's a uh, the rise starts again. And we're, oh wait, we went downhill. So we're not above 1500. So no, we can't do it yet. Oh yeah. I'm excited. Like up. Yeah, so Derek, it'll probably be a couple of isobaths up because we want to get above 1500 to take a rock sample. Yeah, copy that. Keep an eye on the depth there. Yeah. And how did uh, LSU do? They won, so I'm thankful that they stopped watching me. <laughs> Something good happened. Well, yes. they probably still would have won had they watched you. Yeah. Yeah, probably so too. <laughs> but I think it's because I think we lost to them. We went against Mississippi State, and I think we lost to them last year, and that was like a crazy thing because we usually never lose against them. So. So they had to make sure. Yeah, they had to make. So it was. Yeah, so it was serious for them I don't to know, watch I, it. I feel like you can have Nautilus Live on on an iPad and and the game on quiet on the TV or something. But all right. Not, not for my dad, who needs to yell at everything. Oh, okay. Does he yell at Nautilus Live? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Squid, you idiots right there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, come on. That was a perfect rock. Right. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably, he probably would. He probably would. I wouldn't have passed him. He's very vocal. <laughs> Same with my mom about football. She'll she'll start screaming. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> How's Bella doing? Is she still studying? Did she have a test or something? Yeah, I saw chemistry. her. <laughs> she made a post and she was like, I'm so thankful for my friends for my support on that chemistry test. Uh, it was it was pretty it was pretty rough. <laughs> and then I was like, I'm sure you did great. I'm sure you did great. 
I remember chemistry exams, ugh. Or chemical yeah. oceanography exams, bigger, ugh. Yeah, they were something. I actually, I think I enjoyed chemistry exams more than I enjoyed biology exams. <laughs> Actually, I got a better, in high school biology, I got a better grade in that than any other science, but that's because the teacher was really good. I have to say the same. Same with biology Even though and I physics in high school. I was never going into biology, but the teacher was quite good. I actually, I aced the test on plants, and that was my favorite, like, subject in the class. I'm just like, what? I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but uh, the way he taught it was just fascinating. And then I moved on. I have a, uh, a hidden superpower in that I can pass any test. <laughs> you can give me the recertification exam for a 747 pilot, and I'd ace it. There's just uh, there's just a way that things are written. I don't know what it is. I think, uh, when I went to get my driver's license, you have to take the written test on the machine. Yeah. And they sent me to a machine that was in Spanish. I was like, yeah, what the heck? So I took the test, I went back, and they're like, uh, do you speak Spanish? And I said, did I pass? And they're like, yep. I said, yeah, sure do. <laughs> oh my so God. If, if we see you in the pilot seat of a 747, right. yeah, you yeah. get off the plane immediately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, like, my least favorite exams ever were my organic chemistry exams. Which one? Organic chemistry. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, and I just, I don't know. I loved inorganic so, so, so much. Um, but, yeah, those were yeah, some I've rough Yeah, I've heard semesters. horror stories about that. I have a challenge bridging the gap between the academic and the practical. So, like, to in the dive master exam, you're asked how much air you need to fill a balloon to lift in a uh, boat engine that occupies 2.8 cubic feet of seawater at 37 feet of depth. And obviously, uh, like, you know how to do the math, but it's like, A, it's not my engine, why am I taking it? B, I'm just going to fill the bag till the thing lifts. <laughs> but I'll do the math for you. So, yeah. The practical is a threat to academic success. What kind of other samples have been taken on the dive since we got off watch? So we collected an angular rock with a red, with a rare yellow solanifarian. Mm -hmm. um, we took a niskin. We took a uh, sample of a rosellid sponge which are the ones that look like mushroom caps, but long. Mm -hmm. um, we took a snap of Leopathies, which is a black coral. Um, that would be the same species as our very first Kapuna coral that we saw on King George. Oh. Um, what else? That's about it. Wow. All right. All that matters is that we have space for rocks. We so. have space for rocks. Woohoo! But I also love when we get like a double, like a double whammy of like a rock and biology. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what happened with the um, rare yellow Stolenifarian. Um, yeah, I saw that collection actually from the lounge. It actually looked like a bright green to me. It still was kind of like viney corals you're seeing on the rocks, the small ones that look kind of like brown, mm -hmm. but this one's bright green or bright yellow, looks like. Well, I can't wait to see it.
like a dead. Oh yeah. Go for zoom. Yeah, go on in. Holding. Yeah, a couple crinoids, squat lobster, and some ophiorites. And then some fans. And then a little crap. Oh, oh, on oh the, the brachiopods. Oh, brachiopods. Brachiopods. Is it brachio or? I think it's potato potato. I don't think it's a potato. It's a tomato. I hope that squat loster that was on our on her earlier this morning is doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. He's back at the squat lobster lounge telling everybody about it. He probably misses yeah. us. Yeah. I thought about him before <laughs> I took a nap. I was like, I hope he's okay. <laughs> I love the change in texture of these lava flows. It makes me think that they were like two separate flows. Mm. We're looking at pillow basalt right now? Yeah, exactly. So maybe that should be our word of the day. Yeah, stones, pohaku. Pohaku. Mm -hmm. Pohaku. 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 So, P-O, and you have the kahako over the O, which is a macron. It elongates that vowel. H-A-K-U. Is there a space in between po and haku? No. It's no? all one word. Can we get a zoom on that star, please? Where? Oh, there. Or we can just do a run and gun here real quick. If pohaku. Just a quick look. Yeah, oh, I don't think it is what we need. What? Do it is very cute. It's a no, it's not no what they need. Wait, I think we already have it, actually. No, there's a cute little star next to it, too. It's very cute. Oh, I see the little one now. And I love how you whipped around to see the baby. <laughs> I did. I did. I did want to see the cute. baby. I'm trying to look for my, my chapstick. <laughs> <laughs> but I like keep everything in this tote. Didn't you just clean that out? <laughs> well, my wallet unzipped and then my change spilled everywhere. So then I organized it. And then it's still like wearing a tote bag is, is a struggle sometimes because you really have to, <laughs> you have to dig for Water what you Water column. Water column. I love the Aquaphor, yes. Lifesaver, dude. Aquaphor's great. Lifesaver. Mm -hmm. I lost it. Uh, to your right, oh, boom. If you want some, let me know. Because <laughs> it's the one that you just like, you squirt, so it's like, I like that one better than the, the stick. Which is not for sharing. No, <laughs> no I would not share it if it was a stick. <laughs> Actually, my sister one time, she wanted my chapstick and I was like, no, you're not gonna do it because you might get a, like a lip sore or something. And she was like, I'm not gonna get a lip sore. And then sure enough, she got a lip sore. And I was like, that's what I said, you don't share chapstick. And she's like, eh, like, Fish. Yeah. Fish. Well, just in case Big you guys fish. are curious what's in front of us, that I believe that is a discarded mm -hmm. larvation house. Yep, and this fish oh, looks like the fish. one we saw earlier. Massive. Oh yeah, I might be able to reach it. I'm not sure if we ever idea. Another that. fish down below. I think oh, we thought it was some type go. of cup eel. Here we go. Cutthroat eel. Are gonna talk? In this corner. Oh, I see the one now in the back. Go for zoom. That's as far as I can really pull over here. A puhi? That is a, a chimera. Oh, yeah. Chimera and puhi? Yep. Chimera and a puhi. Is Puhi, is there a space between Poo and He? Or is I feel it? like no, it's one word. I think maybe you were right. Maybe we should have stepped over to the left. <laughs> yeah, it's like this connected. <laughs> I feel like the visibility is worse now than it was earlier. We should 
you like me to do it now? <laughs> sure. There's our Kui again. Yeah, he's not bothered by us at all. Mm -mm. So I guess I should say it. He's not bothered by us. Yeah, you can't assume that everything in the sea is a male. But it's, in, you know. We can't assume their pronouns. It's just a uh, hard habit to break. Now. That's interesting, yeah, when you think about it, because even like ships are, co are considered so she's. Track the line bearing 315 at 0 0.3. Yeah, that's a common convention. I don't Thank know you. why that is. Well, it's, uh, they've stopped doing that now. Ships are uh, just it's now. You know, like uh, it sank on its maiden voyage instead mm -hmm. of she sank. Are we looking at what kind of flow is this? Looks low, low Yeah. Wow. You're really, you're really learning. Yeah, I'm getting good. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't be a Pohaku expert. <laughs> Pohaku. <laughs> now, though, I'm not sure. This looks now more sheep. That's what I was going to say. But what's the difference between low bait and sheep? So like earlier with that low bait, it was kind of like a, the way I describe it is like, I don't yeah, know. like it has like divots in it or um, lines or it, it reminds me of like a brain, like the mm. texture of a brain. And then sheet is just like a sheet of paper, flat. Oh, oh, hello. Hello. Oh, big eye. This guy is different. Right? So I love his arm. Very pretty. Kupai Anaha. Wait. Kupai Anaha. Amazing. Do we have capture yet? Yeah, I've got a couple captures. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out. No, I didn't know if you've gotten access to it again. Oh, yeah, I got it. I always had access. The problem was I was extremely frozen. I couldn't tell when I was doing it. <laughs> the face that he's giving right now is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he's pretending to be dead. Okay, now he's just checking us out. So oh, cool. just got the ID. This guy is Bathy Trocates. Looks like a Sela camp. Uh, coelacanth have far more lobe fins. So it's a lobate instead of sheet fish? Sure. Theoretically. So, yeah, look at these like little lines. That's kind of reminds me of lobate. Unless that's just sediment in the crevice, but... It is, I mean, there is sediment in the crevice. The question but, is where yeah, the crevice yeah. came from. Yes, that's... Then look at this. This is all like cement, but like looks like cemented pillow lavas together. Looks like a drop over there. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good question from a viewer. They're wondering for everyone in the van, what's the most amazing thing that you've learned on this cruise that's outside your area of expertise? Um, that's I feel like it's hard for me because I've been learning so many different things. Like I've had a lot of fun learning about just mapping specifically, but I also, I think the thing I've had like the most fun with is like helping out 
on the deck during launch. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've, um, I've actually not seen uh, underwater lava flows before. Because oh. um, the places that I've worked have been Whoa. fairly sedimentary, oh, wow. like the Black Sea and speaking of lava flows. What is that? It looks like <laughs> a exposed sheet flow. I was interrupted by a lava flow. <laughs> Oh, yeah, how's that God. coral getting so in its current pretty. flow back there? This must be a pass through of some kind. Can I get overhang? some zoom in? Oh, what's that? That guy Where are you? at the top. This? Yes. No, the other one. Oh, the coral. This? Yes. Yeah. That guy looks soft and flowy. I'd like a zoom in if possible. All right. Oh, this is so pretty. Go for zoom. Go on in. Got a shrimp? Oh, dang. This reminds me of looking at the uh, large pools. Oh, oh yeah. Shrimp. Yeah. Is that enough or you want it full? Okay, full's in. Too far away to count. Huh. This might be a parazoanthid investing another coral because there's two different polyps. Yep. Thank you. Right. I think those are hemichoralliums hanging in there. Oh, wow, that is a great view that of the rock. Beautiful. I love it. Pohaku. Pohaku. I just want to touch them. It looks like, uh, reminds me of Pride Rock a little. Yeah. I just want to touch it and just like run my hands on it. And just be like, and pet the Pohaku. I think the one thing that I've like that I've learned so far that's out of my comfort zone is, or geology is just all the Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. I think that's been the most fascinating thing that I've learned about. And also being able to tell what a bamboo coral and what a bubblegum coral is mm -hmm. is pretty never thought that I would be able to tell the difference. Never. Yeah. But definitely a standout for me as as a Hawaiian the Hawaiian yeah. culture. I think for me, it's been learning, um, you know, the deep sea and all of the organisms that make their home there, you know, brand new words for species I've never seen before. So um, I'm learning so much. Oh, specifically, I like learning how the sea mounts were being named. I thought that was really cool to hear. Yeah. The story behind that. Because I always wonder how they pick these names and what they mean. So it was really nice to have you explain that to me, Miss, Miss Malia. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you do it 10 degrees? Oh. Where are these cracks, Anna? I know. I was just thinking like a 20 that. 20-meter move at 10 degrees. I was thinking. Oh. They look so like linear. Across that catwalk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but they kind of, they don't continue. So I, I don't think it's anything. I think it just cracked like that. Yeah, because there could be faulting and app. stuff afterwards. So, yeah, I think it's still a sheet flow. Sebastian, what's. The most amazing thing that you've zero learned. Two zero meters. Bearing, um, zero one zero. I like learning a lot about the Battle of Midway mm -hmm. and the different Thank details you. regarding those three ships and how they interacted during the battle. Um, I also really enjoy the cultural aspects of this expedition as well. I'm learning a lot about Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could learn more when I'm actually in Hawaii, but I think UH does not only requires like one Hawaiian cultural class, so I haven't had the opportunity to learn in depth. I'm just gonna follow this. Okay, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been I did, so grateful for that aspect, especially, um, and I know that's something that I'm just so grateful for and really want to take home to my students. Yeah, and I think it's it's not the normal to have so many Kanaka'o Eevee on board. So, you know, we've, we 
this expedition is um, loaded with people who have cultural expertise. So really, really fortunate, you know, that we, we have that and be able to share it in the different watches and, you know, with the crew. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a really good um, kind of framework for other organizations who want to engage in indigenous spaces is to have those, you know, opportunities for the people of the place to be a part of it because it adds such a richness to the to the expedition. Yeah, definitely. And I mentioned it earlier, but um, while we're talking about this, for our viewers that are on the NautilusLive.org website, if you scroll down on the very front page, um, you'll see recent highlights, and there are three, two videos and a blog down there. And there's a video titled A Shared Voyage of Ocean Exploration, and we watched it all together yesterday. Um, and it was so special and just makes me so excited to be part of this and to see that representation. This is just amazing. And then also, um, I know that we've done a couple of ship to shore interactions in a little Hawaii, and that's been like really just nice to just yes. see that, um, just see how far, um, this reach has gone. It has. And you know, it's been a, it's been a, um, it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. It took a lot of work on many, many people's behalf and, um, you know, three years in the making. And so, um, you know, this is kind of the culmination mm -hmm. of that really hard work that OET, our staff at Papahanaumokuakea, our cultural working group, have been really diligent in, in creating space for indigenous people to lead and to, um, you know, really participate, um, not just as a box that you check off, right. but as really leading those those protocols and the, the kind of research that's conducted, in, especially in indigenous spaces. You know, we are the most intimately connected and have the deepest knowledge of these places, and um, that's generational, you know, sometimes for a millennium, you know, for some of our um, native brothers and sisters. And so these projects, take a lot of time and effort and thought about who we are hoping to to um, engage with. And you know, with the young youth of Hawaii, with the, um, the Hawaiian language speakers and our Kula Kayopuni, our Hawaiian immersion schools, to be able to see role models doing, you know, expedition and exploration, speaking in Olelo Hawaii, incorporating cultural practice with science methodologies is huge. It's huge. And so, you know, having um, our, our youth be able to see and um, have access to resources in their language um, that highlights their cultural perspectives is, it, it really is a huge um, blessing. Mm -hmm. And um, just, you know, it's, it's so hard for me to speak on it because my grandkids are going to be the recipients of this, you know, my great grandchildren and, you know, so many of our youth in Hawaii. So it touches a real deep chord in me. You know, that's why I do what I do is because I'm thinking about the ones who come after me, yeah. you know, the generations that come after and that they be leading these kind of explorations in their communities. So powerful. I know. Um, didn't you do an interaction the other day with your grandson's class? I did. Yeah. So my grandson's in preschool at the Punana Leo o Waialua, which is a, um, a Hawaiian immersion preschool. So they're three, four-year-olds. Oh. It was so beautiful. It was amazing. And, um, you know, just showing them the different organisms, the ia. So ia is like the fish or the organisms in the ocean and then being able to name it in Hawaiian language, mm -hmm. you know, seeing the ship, the moku, um, seeing us on the, on the kai, on the, on the ocean. And then they gifted us with a song. So they sang a mele, a song for oh. us, and they did the motions. And they were singing about the different ia, the different ia of the, the ocean, the fish um, that they're familiar with. So it was just beautiful, and he was so cute. He was inching closer and closer to the camera, <laughs> so he could be closer to Tutu. <laughs> but it was it was just so precious to be able to connect 
across, you know, the thousands of miles that separate us, but yeah. being able to connect through Olelo Hawaii. Wow. That's so precious and like such a special memory. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Oh, that makes my heart so happy. Mm -hmm. I definitely would have been tearing up in there. <laughs> I was. <laughs> <laughs> I first came up into the monument 10 years ago, and the in cultural engagement has grown exponentially. Uh, you know, it, it's always been there, but the, especially on this expedition, the it degree looks like the to OET is uh, fantastic. Hannah, I don't think I got to ask you about your ship to shore with your school. Oh yeah, it was me and Catalina, who's mm -hmm. a navigator for from the eight to twelve ship watch, and um, yeah, so we found out that we go to the same high school, Dominican in New go Orleans, St. Mary's Dominican in New Orleans, and one of my favorite teachers. Well, that's was an urchin. Vanna. Ah. Urchin. Would you call it, Malia? Vanna. 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 But one W A N A. W A N A. I'm very familiar with that one. Yeah. <laughs> they hurt if you step on it. <laughs> yeah, you use different words when you step on it. <laughs> also, four letters, though. You know what were you saying? Oh, yeah. So. One of my favorite teachers, which was my bio two teacher, Miss Koenig, she really was a big inspiration for me wanting to do marine biology when I was a senior. And that's why I went into college with, as a bio major. But basically her daughter and I were, were best friends. She lives in New York, and which is really sad. So we live on like opposite coasts mm -hmm. and Basically, I reached out to Rebecca because I don't have Miss Koenig's phone number or I don't know her email either. And I was like, hey, Rebecca, like, is there any way that I can set up a ship to shore? Well, I was explaining to her what a ship to shore was mm -hmm. with, like, your mom and, and the biology class. I think she would really enjoy it because we did a lot of dissections of echinoderms, sharks, squids, mm -hmm. all different types of sea Could animals. So... I was like, I think she would really love, like, I would love to, like, share this experience with her. And Rebecca was like, absolutely, I'll send her your number right now. And so I texted Miss Koenig and I, um, we were able to work out a date to talk to the biotech club, which is actually a club that I was a part of and I totally forgot that I was a part of that club. <laughs> but um, so we talked to the biotech club and a lot of my old professors were there. Uh, my physics pr professor was there. Ms. Koenig was there, my bio one teacher was there, uh, and my soccer coach was there. Yes. <laughs> me and Catalina background, uh, we also were on the same, we were on Dominican soccer, but she graduated seven years before I did. I, so I graduated in 2018. And um, yeah, so I heard about Catalina from my coach because he would always talk about like how good his team was because they won state, which is like, Insane, incredible. Yeah. So, and um, then y'all meet for the first time yeah. on Nautilus. And then we met for the first time on Nautilus, and that was insane. That is that is pretty low chances, honestly. Very yeah. low, very low. Because when I was like, yeah, I went to school in New Orleans, and she was like, so did I. And I was like, <laughs> where did you go? And she was like, Dominican. And I was like, oh, my gosh. You're that, Catalina. I was, <laughs> yeah. well, I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, yeah, so she was amazing. She played soccer in college. She played for LSU. So that's, cool. that's like big, big leagues. But it's like what we saw this morning. Yeah. It was literally so much fun talking to them. It was so oh, much I fun. And it was so cool, like seeing the younger generation What's of like Dominican girls. And like seeing the uniform again was also surreal because like we had to wear a uniform every day, which was also great because I didn't have to think about anything when I was like, wake up in the morning, because I would wake up really early. But uh, yeah, I loved it. It was so much fun. Uh, yeah, that makes me so happy. I had a similar experience. I came out here and met Dwight Coleman, who was an expedition lead, and we went to the same high school. <gasps> oh, really? Oh, wow. And his brother uh, lived 
two streets down from me, about a, like two blocks away. And my family was good friends with his, his cool. uh, extended wow. family. Yeah, it's a small world. But you hadn't met him until you got out here, right? Nope, I hadn't. Yeah. I knew his, uh, who his brother was, though. Even though he works at URI. Yeah, no, I didn't know him. Yeah. That's You're wild. about the same age as his sons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah probably. Co-pilot, can you swing your heading around to zero, one, zero? Take a look at the sonar. Well. All right, so we're at 15.53. So we have another 50 meters to go before we can grab a rock. I was about to say, I'm not seeing Oh, oh, oh Puhi. Puhi. <laughs> Puhi. Are those parasites? Derek, you did say zero, one, zero? Yep. No. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, here comes a bonk. Also, Kukui, if you're listening to this, this is the Puhi that I was talking about earlier. <laughs> and I didn't know how to describe how big it was. Because I was like, did you see a, a big eel? Did you see one? And I was like, it looks like the length of like one of my arms. And she was like, no, I saw like one of the little baby ones. And I was like, OK, well, we saw like this massive one that I you haven't seen before. So. Yep. Parasite on the back there, thing. Sebastian? I'm sorry? Is that a parasite there, that white marking? I'm looking the... at that. It actually looks like scarring Yeah, to I was going to say, it oh, could okay. be like Thank something you. tried to bite him. Or the one that got away. They are a survivor. Wow. <laughs> Beyonce would be proud. <laughs> what would try and bite it? Predators. I was, thinking, huh? <laughs> I was thinking a squat lob. <laughs> <A> squat lob. <laughs> it looks like bite marks to me. The little sharks. Little sharks. There are sharks. There's think, other big fish. I actually don't think a shark would try to. Would, it's about the same size as the, one of those sharks, so probably not. It's pro there are larger deep sea sharks, though. Oh, yeah. That's true. But the bite wasn't that big. Maybe it was like a tussle. Yeah, it could have been a tussle. I'm not sure if these guys are territorial or not or anything. Yeah. They're big, so there's usually a reason why they're big. So these are more sheet flows, you know? Yeah. All right. Well done. Oh, did you have any notes on that 90 degree cliff hang that we saw earlier? Do we have what? I don't, I didn't write down any notes, but it was cool because you got to see like the, I guess, um, what the sheet looks like horizontally. Yeah. Like exposed horizontally. So. You can see the stratigraphy. Yeah. Your favorite yeah. topic. Stratigraphy. Actually, that's my friend Ashton's favorite topic. Real we'll relief at video. But stratigraphy is cool. It's also a tedious part of geology. How about you explain what stratigraphy is for our viewers, Hannah? Yeah, so basically stratigraphy is um, mapping, I'm sure if you've looked up, up to the anything related to geology, like the okay. different eras or time periods, you will see like, it's, it looks like an exposed cliffside, and then you see the multiple like layers. Two and five. each of those layers Two is, nine zero. Two nine zero. makes up, well, you would document it and write down and give a description of the rock that you see like, oh, this looks like a shale because it has this dark color. It's easily, it's brittle and it's, it has some fossils in it. So you would like write that down. And then you could say, oh, I just saw limestone, fossiliferous limestone, or just fine grain limestone. But I guess you really didn't say fine grain limestone, but limestone in general. Starfish. Yeah. Starfish. So it's basically, yeah, just like looking at the different layers of rocks and um, making a call. It looks like a column and just giving a description for each of those layers of what you see. And hopefully when you're also doing stratigraphy is where you look for like biomarkers. So like different fossils because mm. different fossils can indicate like a time period. Like, for example, because I love the trilobites, trilobites died after the Permian. So, you know that if you ever find a trilobite in, uh, in a rock, it has to be 
before the, like before the Permian extinction mm -hmm. and not during the dinosaurs like in the Cretaceous mm -hmm. so that's like an example of how to use fossils as a way to tell what time period you're in or what you're looking at where's a good place for people to go and like view stratigraphy like Grand Canyon Ooh, no actually whenever you're on roads yeah and you go past a mountain and you see like the clip like the side of the mountain and so there's a road cut yeah yeah road cut outcrops they're fantastic so I I have to constantly remind myself to stop like looking over when I'm driving because oh my gosh. so many times I'm like oh my god it's so cool and then I'm like oh no you need to like look at the road especially in LA I'm like you need to, you need to stop so basically stratigraphy is a uh, I mean, it's it's a when you say it this way, it's kind of an obvious uh, theory or study in a way. But it's um, oh, there's a coral. It's uh, it's this, the idea that something that was deposited earlier is below something that was deposited later. Uh, and archaeology uses it quite a bit too, just on different time scales uh, to geology. Yeah. Um, so if if you're looking at a rock layer, unless there was a fold or faulting or some uplifts of that kind, you know, the general understanding is that. Uh, the stuff that's above is going to be younger than the stuff that's below. Yeah, because there's like five different laws of geology. <laughs> so I think that one of them is the law of, I think it's something with an S. Stratigraphy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just checking. <laughs> the book that I've been reading, The Soundings, um, I was reminded of like uniform uniformitarianism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uniformitarianism. Um, and I was like, I haven't thought about this in a long time. Yeah, that's that's intro for me, and I'm like trying to remember. I know. And stratigraphy is okay, such an important. Okay, superposition. That's what it's called. And that's such an important part of terrestrial archaeology, mm -hmm. right? When you're doing your excavation, yep. the deeper you go, you assume it's older. Unless there's other things like tsunamis, or you know, there's yeah. there could be natural phenomena that destroy that kind of strategic stratigraphic layers. A viewer recommended um, yeah. to look up books called Roadside Geology yes. for different yeah. states. Yes, oh of my gosh. States, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Have to say, I have like a whole bunch of them. Oh my god. I <laughs> literally got one for Southern California and I saw that there was, so I went to Laguna Beach and I only went there because there were green schists, big conglomerates mm -hmm. of green schists it can't really be a conglomerate, but it's part. It was the larger <laughs> grains in a conglomerate of sedimentary rock. Mm -hmm. So basically, I went to this beach, and it had all these green shifts everywhere, and I was freaking out because I had never seen a metamorphic rock at a beach before. So totally geeking, and now it's like one of my favorite beaches, and I go back <laughs> all the time, and I just uh. like keep looking at all the rocks, and I'm like, this is the best beach ever. And everyone's wondering why there's a girl staring away from the ocean instead yeah, of at yeah, the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I probably do look a little strange, but it's okay. That's so, so okay. It's okay. <laughs> it is okay. There's another uh, set of books that for, for like uh, intro geologists or even, I mean, they're for people, for students studying who are even well along their way. Um, John McPhee's Annals of a Former World, which consists of five different shorter books that he wrote. And I forget the titles of them, uh, but John McPhee. He, write, he writes just incredibly well, you, like uh, a prose that you can just follow, but you're learning geology along the way. He basically interviewed five different geologists in different um, segments of the United States and tells the history of the United States through the geology, oh, like one so section cool. at a time. He does like the Delaware Gap. Um, he does the, the fault zone off of like Southern California, like the Baja, yeah. the, uh, the strike slip fault there. Um, and I forget the other three, um, but it is just, his, his, his writing is so good that anybody can pick it up and read it as if it's a novel, but you're learning ge the geology of the United States as you what go. What is it it's called? The, the, the compendium, like the compilation of it, is called The Annals of the Former World. Um, but it's, it's a, uh, they Wait, were all did you say mammals? Annals, A-N-N-A-L-S, like archive. Um, but it, I forget what all of them are called. It's, it's, it's a combined volume of five of his earlier works that were all published separately. You can also get them individually, but I, the, the volume is, is nice to have, too. Who is it by? Sorry. John McPhee. Uh, M-C-P-H-E-E. -E. So, in addition to roadside geology books, I thought that they're just, 
is just so e so accessible to to learn United States uh, geology or North American geology. Yeah. I guess I would say um, it's kind of irrelevant in political geopolitical boundaries. Yeah. So whoever brought up roadside geology, they yeah. know what's up. Yeah, they, <laughs> they do. They know what's up. I've got like I've got like six or seven of those. They have great illustrations too, which make all the difference. Oh, it's the, fantastic. The roadside geology books too. I'd like those for my classroom now. Yeah. I've got some well, good especially North Carolina one. Yeah. Yeah. Did they do it for they, Hawaii? They do. They yeah? for sure do. I think I have it actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, because we came to visit um, Hawaii in 2004, my family, and I think I got that. And then there's like a, it's like a general book about Hawaiian archaeology called Fish Hooks and Something Else. Oh, yeah, again. Patrick Kirch. Yeah. Yeah, he's um, a rock star of Hawaiian yeah. archaeology. So, um, I, I like I insisted on buying an archaeology and a geology book in Hawaii when I was here, and we had to go to like three Barnes and Nobles for me to find one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was like, no, mom and dad, I have to get this He's here. He's a prolific like, writer. And they're like, can't you just order it when we get home? I'm like, no, I have to get it here. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a thing. <laughs> is it? Is it this one? Yep, that's it. He's actually a professor um, over at UH Manoa. Now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. cool. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Can you explain the geology we're seeing here? Yeah. So this is still looking like, I feel like it's just a broken up sheet flow right now. I don't think it's specifically low B. So this lava was moving really fast. You said a broken off sheet rock, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. So especially since we're, looks like we're heading upslope, it could be broken because it was on, on a slope, broken up. Yes, we're definitely heading up slope. If you can see over my shoulder, I can, yeah. Yeah, we're aiming for just above 1,500 meters to take a rock sample. Unless we see, are we over there? Oh, we're almost there. Uh, 40, 40 meters. Okay. What's this yellowish right here? I don't know. This is one thing that I brought up with Dr. Val once about this coloration, and not quite sure what it is yet. Yeah, I would describe this as multiple sheet flows on top of each other. Yeah, because I was talking to Val, I didn't know how to describe when someone asks, like, it's not a caldera, but I was trying to explain this collapse. Yeah. We don't have a geologist on our, our watch. I love that you're trying to be the geologist, mm -hmm. Mia. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. I do collect rocks. I know you do. Yeah. I got into the rock hounding. Also have books about it. I we have it. to teach Mia our Hawaiian word for yes. rock. Yes, yes, yes. Pohaku. 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 So yeah, why is there such a drastic drop right here? So we're on the kind of the edge of this major sheet flow. I think it yeah. was like the um we saw the, we had the big collapse on the dive yesterday too. I think it's like a slope failure. Mm-hmm, exactly. How does a slope failure happen? Uh, can be a fault or an earthquake or any other ideas? Yeah, I would, I would definitely lean more towards a fault. Well, yeah, well, I suppose it would have caused an earthquake too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so like there can be after rock is lava and rock are deposited, um, there can be other stresses that cause um, local faults. Not, you know, we're not talking about plate boundaries or anything like that, but you know, local faults that'll shift things around. And if, if uh, you know, if the, the say the lava flow that was on top is larger and heavier than some of the and some lava flows below are are weaker and it doesn't support it, it would cause a, mm. you know, collapse. That looks like one large bolosomid. Thirty meters. It's just like yesterday. They're going to come relieve you for dinner, but you're going to have to wait for your to get your rock. <laughs> you can get it when you come back. Yeah. 
Unless you want to go now. Okay. I'm too invested. <laughs> okay. So we were just given some really good recommendations related to geology. Does yes. anyone have any recommendations for deep sea species? Or any kind of books or... Sebastian will probably know. I see a book over there uh -huh. that says deep sea fishes. Deep sea mm -hmm. fishes is okay. It's a black and white one, so it's not gonna be the tell all, give all, unless you really know taxonomy. Um, one I would suggest is deep sea biology. It's literally called that, the textbook. Um, that one's really good. That's the one I learned deep, from my deep sea bio class, and it was really useful. Um, in regards to that, um, there's a lot of other more um, publicly facing in terms of deep sea animal books. They won't get into the scientific names as well, but they are good for learning the basic animals, the deep, how they operate, etc. Nice, thank you. So this is still more road to cheap flow? Um, <laughs> I would probably say now looking looking low bait fish, but I don't know if it's just because the sheet flow is broken up. But I think it's one of the I think it's just a sheet flow like really destroyed by whatever faulting occurred. And also there are some pillow basalts. I'm looking at low bait flows versus sheet flows because I want to get better at recognizing the I difference. Mean, yeah, it's still like sometimes hard for me to tell the difference because then I'll see something and I'm like, okay, I can see how I can see the defense for it being a sheet flow, and I can also see a defense for it being a low bait flow. Because luckily in your textbook, you know, they only give you one example of like what it'll look like, and it's like the perfect example. Mm -hmm. And then when you see something that's not directly that, it's like, well, I'm just making a guess, an educated guess on this. Can there be like a, a flow that's both sheep and low bait or like a sheep flow that has low baits or I don't know, like a combination and not directly like one, at one or the other? Maybe if the change of velocity occurred, but oh, yeah. that's that, I wouldn't be surprised if something. Yeah. Are we getting close to... Uh, no, we're at 30 meters still, 28. <laughs> this is Sorry, a cool I'm rock. I'm so excited. Yes, it's a big boulder. A pillow boulder. Pillow basalt, basalt boulder. Yeah, we saw a few of these on our watch and they were, they tended to have um, some of the uh, interesting life forms, you know, compared to the rest of the seafloor. So this is a pillow basalt? Is that what you just, said? I would describe it as a just a massive pillow basalt. A boulder. So would those have been spewed out like individually or broken off um, a larger kind of flow? Uh, you know? I feel like it would be broken off from a larger flow. Because I know over on, um, you've been there, um, Hannah, to Kilauea. Nice There's shot like for these the boulder bombs. Oh, I uh, know. Those lava bombs that yes. come out and they're huge, like boulder sized um, mm -hmm. pieces that were spewn like individually out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if, I, or at least I haven't read before that there's something similar to a volcanic bomb like on a, a terrestrial volcano versus a underwater volcano. Uh -huh. 
I'm not sure. I can't answer. But I, yeah, I don't know if there's a underwater volcano equivalent of a, a bomb. A, a, not a bomb, I mean, but a volcanic like <laughs> bomb. <laughs> So I'm looking at pictures of Pahoehoe flow. Yeah. And this is what lobate looks like underwater, or it looks uh, similar to lobate. Well, it, it's no? different because it's an underwater flow versus yeah. a, a subaerial flow. Like uh, lava is going to uh, move differently and cool differently when it enters directly underwater. It's going to cool faster. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to answer all your questions. We have a Sako in the chat asking when the last minute is minutes of the dive will be? Uh, probably uh, in like an hour and a half. I, I'm going to confirm that with Daniel when I go down for dinner though. Uh, we're going to be coming up on deck around uh, 8 o'clock p.m. local time and it's uh, 5.20 now so yeah. Well, we have about an hour, a little over an hour ascent probably, hour 15. That's not bad. Oh, then we could probably do our cultural protocol about seven. They've been doing that in um, the science um, chat, which has been really cool oh, because okay. it includes everybody who's watching gets to participate in that as we mahalo Kanaloa, we mahalo the depths, we thank them for the gifts that they have given us um, by viewing, by um, the samples that are collected. In case you're wondering, we're about 180 meters away from the top waypoint. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think, okay, so we have about 10 meters to go until, we're probably want, gonna collect a rock right at the like last uh, ice and bath before that, um, uh, hill there where waypoint 10 is but like are you saying pretty soon because the ship's tracking a line so you want to you want to um, yeah why don't we um, slow the ship if not stop because um, I think Hannah right will want to get a sample like halfway between where we are and the top of the ridge yeah so yes yeah, slowing just and stopping the ship would be good what's best for you guys slowing or stopping what's best Oh, I'm getting the rock? Well, maybe. Okay. Hmm. All right. So now we don't we don't need to stop here yet. Um Yeah, so it's gonna take a while for Adelensis to come up. Yep. So that's why I asked Dan and Jake what would be better and they said stop, but Okay, we can stop and then yeah, continue. Yeah, because it's even though the ship stop, it's we're still going to be going. So like quite, a, I think we're probably going to hit like really close. Well, we're, if the ship stops, we're probably going to swing back, right? But if you want up here and they're moving forward, then I think they're going to land around the area where you want to collect the rock. Okay. But it's okay if I'm wrong. So we had two other deep sea species books recommended by some viewers. One is called Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and The Deep Origins of Consciousness by Peter Godfrey Smith. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I've heard of that one. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's another one titled Deep, or sorry, titled Below the Edge of Darkness. A memoir of exploring light and life in the deep sea by Edith. Edith uh, Witter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's an incredibly famous deep sea biologist. She's the one who was able to break, take photo, live photos of Archituthis doe using the burglar alarm method nope. mimicry. Nope. Nope. Yep. Awesome. That memoir has a lot of good reviews online. So, uh, Oksana, the a red little, corals, a little higher up. Those are staropathies, yeah. yeah? The red black corals? The red ones, like, over there. Oh, no. No. Those are uh, in the Coralian family. Okay. Probably a hemicorallian. The smaller black coral, bushy black corals, they are either staropathies or a species of uh, leopathies. Okay. So uh, there's a little bit of confusion. That's why it has been collected. So. Okay. Because I definitely saw some of the leopathies. It's just that these dark red, kind of like red yeah. ones. I've been playing as sauropathies because of the chat and this image. <laughs> but if do you think they're, what, what were you thinking they were again? They were coralids. The coralids. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Can we zoom in on that crack right there where the green lights are? The cr this guy? No, the black hole. I saw something black slip in there. This? Yeah. I'm sorry. This? Yes. Thank you. Something what just zoomed, slid back inside. I can't see a crap. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so jealous of your guys' marker system back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need a it's special so great. one. Did you, you have your stick? Wait, who no, said that? This, this oh, Mia said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, that's a little egg sack or something. Yeah, this looks like those oh, can those be break your pods as well. Oh, see, it's coming out. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's coming out. Is it a crab? It's a fish, I think. It's a fish, I think. It's checking us out. How did I see that? Yeah, that's a good question. It looks like a snake. Oh, it's going back in. Slithering out. <laughs> He's yeah. Like, oh, no. I don't want to <laughs> see that light. There's too much light for me. Yeah. That's funny. Looks like some pom poms over yeah, there. Yeah, I'm going to check with Daniel when I go down there at some point. Yeah, but we need to get a rock sample in this as soon as we get to this next. So I'm going to do that and then go. Unless Hannah gets back up here and then whatever. We'll see. Uh, yeah, like one contour up or so. Uh, Val wanted it uh, above 1500, which we just got to now. So soon, soon we'll do it. I'm gonna, I'm keeping my eye out. Mm -hmm. uh, none of this stuff looks loose though. No, there's uh, there's some Stoloniferin corals along the edge, yeah. above the ferrate sponges. Do you want to zoom? Uh, we can continue. Okay. I can call in another ten. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Bridge now. Well, the rock is full of little brachiopods and cup cords. Love your right. metallic cord too. All right, guys, I'm going to hand it back over to Derek. Thanks, Mia. I hope you find a really great angular rock. <laughs> it's just a flat lava flow here. It's not helpful. I'm going to fail in my task. What about that beauty right there, middle of the screen? Yeah, I mean... Too big? I don't know. Um, we're doing another 10 meter move, so I think I'll oh. wait till that's done. Yeah, smart. Um, that looks pretty appetizing, though. <laughs> <laughs> appetizing. I've never heard anyone say that about a rock. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> One time my mom made a dirt cake uh, for my brother's birthday where he pulled like a gummy worm out of the, the Oreo pudding I and ate it. it in front of our, our relatives and they were like, ew, oh, no. it's great. It is something that my brother would have done. <laughs> so they all actually believe that it was real because he would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There's an chin. And we have more flat lava that's not able to be sampled. Awesome. You sound excited. Yeah, because I'm supposed to get a sample. Uh, let's see. Maybe over over this rock, there's mm -hmm. like a sandy area. Maybe that's a place we can find a loose rock. Yeah. Yeah, I think this could be good. 
Um, Looks like, like it. around where your lasers are right now. We could get closer there and. Right in front of this wall. Look at that wall. Wow. That's like a legit wall. Yeah, there's a spiral whip, which I'm confused whether it's hanging upside down from the wall <laughs> um, or growing from the... Oh, yeah. Maybe it's doing both, actually. There's some so, crinoids, ferrets, um, Jake, maybe something like in this area. Okay. Those look like good sizes. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, Hannah will come back and scream, no, not that one, right as we're taking it. <laughs> it looks like it's hanging upside down. <laughs> it I mean, it's, like it. it's got itself in the water column, so yeah. whatever, whatever it takes. And that can be a stick of patties, but we have to zoom in to have a closer mm -hmm. look. It looks like it is not attached on the bottom, so no. yeah. Um, I'm thinking maybe this one. Oh, I lost the one I circled now. Let's try, let's give this one a shot. Okay. Yeah, that looks it's angular. bit angular as yeah. well. I'm assuming it's not too buried in like large mm -hmm. underneath there. I think that'll, I think that'll have the Hannah stamp Where's approval. Where's this gonna go? Uh, that's a good question, Taylor Ann. I almost said Sebastian and that's not who's <laughs> sitting there right now. <laughs> uh, that could go in starboard box C. Cool. Remind me again, they all look similar. <laughs> that one, yeah, okay. I love this screen. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a oh, great that's, size. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, there's definitely alteration there. And some ophiroids on it. At least one ophiroid. <laughs> Swim away, little guy. That's cool. So it's clearly a manganese coating. Do you prove? <laughs> oh, yeah, I prove. Yes, I picked a good one. See, you're becoming a geologist. <laughs> so uh, well, the irony is, the irony is I actually am a geologist. <laughs> Just not my prime function. All right, I'm gonna. You want to sit, or you want to switch over here? Or? All right, I'm gonna start oh, swinging guys, around I'll be here. back. Thank you, Ed. Uh oh, I lost it. Wait, you lost a rock? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, really? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I must have hit it against the wall or something and fell out of the jaws. Oh my gosh. I'll, I'll bring my, the jaws over. It's not in there. Uh, well, we can pick another one. Sorry about that. That would look like a good one. Yeah, it, it did. But it's okay. So, maybe... Maybe this one? Okay. The other ones look too big. Wow, 
This guy looks old. Perfect. Love it. Okay, I'll make well, sure. Well, actually, okay, this one's thin? actually pretty. Yes, it's thin. Okay. We'll put that one back where we found it. Thank you. Wow, okay. Um, maybe the one right below it, this one. This one looks, this one looks good. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna make sure to tuck the arm in nice and good this time. What kind of starfish is that? In the family Goniasterid, but I'm not sure about the genus. B, correct? No, uh, C. Oh, C. Yeah, sorry. That was sample number 067. Starboard box C. Yep. C. <laughs> uh, is there anything else we should be looking closely at before we move up this nice big wall? Uh, would you want to look at this uh, upside down? Yes. Yes. The upside down web would be really cool to have a look at. Floating now from the thrusters. It has a dark patch. For zoom there, Ed. Yeah, this would be a stick of Athies. Thank you. Athies, yeah, no problem. Did you want to see what that different color was? Uh, in the middle. Uh huh. Yeah, I think it's just damaged partially there, and it's the dead tissue that's hanging from the skeleton, mm -hmm. exposing the black skeleton of the black corals. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the chat we had <coughs> a question. Um, they're saying, okay, biology question. I know that corals and sponges are animals, but do they have nerves? What can they sense about their environment? To have senses, do you need nerves? And um, uh, I can answer shortly. 
um, corals, I believe, have something called like a nerve net um, that helps them do basic things like, you know, contract. And um, sponges, I looked up, there was actually a pretty cool article on, um, it's called Sponge Innards Suggest How Nerve Cells Evolved on science.org. Um, and basically they were saying that um, some of these um, cells in the sponge were nerve-like. So not your typical nerve morphology, but um, similar genes to what we would see in nerves. Yeah, absolutely. So they have sensory organs and sensory systems. Uh, bio, in their bio plan, they have sensory uh, tissue, but not necessarily in the sense that we would imagine uh, the nervous system to be, right. say, in us or other mammals, but they definitely have sensory organs in place. Yeah, and they can also sense, like, chemicals in the water. Um, they Do they have, like, mechanoreceptors as well, like, sensing touch things when they touch yeah, them? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. They have something which I think I, I, oh. I don't remember the exact term for it. I have to check, but yes. Cool. They can, they can sense touch. You see, we see the polyps contracting, right? So they're reacting to the right. ROVs and the lights and the pressure is being there. So. Yeah. So hope that offers a little insight. It's probably a retracted uh, anthomastus or pseudo anthomastus that we, that we are looking at, the pink in the center. Mm -hmm. To me, it almost it almost looks like an anemone, but I know I know it's not. Yeah, you can see why it's called the mushroom coral. Mm -hmm. It's so cute when the polyps are retracted. So, did y'all say if anything on this these rocks or did? Oh, uh, like previously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes there are lots of ophiroids, some barnacles, lots of cup corals. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a very cool close up of a anthem. A baby jellyfish. I forgot which one has a stalk. What? Yeah. Um, I think we've been seeing pseudo anthomastus pseudo without anthomastus, the stalk. Yeah. So this is probably an anthomastus with all polyps of its polyps retracted. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it totally looks like a mushroom, a yeah. muffin, or a cupcake. No, yeah, muffins also. Nice or like knowledge. a toad from yeah. the Mario <laughs> yeah, world. Yeah. Yeah. He was probably my favorite character in the, in the new movie, was Toad. That was, he was the best. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that movie yet. I should We're do just that. Doing two I haven't seen the new one either. I think it's on um, Peacock. Mm. 
but I, I, yeah, I didn't see it in the movie theaters, but I saw that it was on Peacock and I was like, huh, it's like, this is probably really fun, a fun thing to turn my brain off and watch. And it was. <coughs> yeah, so we're gonna step back a little bit, and then we'll go forward. Do you expect more life to be towards the top, or? Uh, given what we have been seeing uh, on the sea mount, honestly, no. Uh, we may see slightly higher uh, density, uh, like how we were encountering during our watch, but uh, not much different. Would we want a eDNA at the top? Yeah, we could collect an eDNA sample at the top. So far we have collected uh, four, so we have two more. Because I, th I think we talked about doing it at the top yeah. Just yeah, we have see. enough left over to be able to do that, to take a background. White. Pretty sea star. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. He has skinny arms. Yeah. Very bright red. Mm-hmm. And a uh, sea urchin right there that we saw earlier. Yes, yes. We saw one a little while ago as well. Oh, is this a pumice? Or is that a dead sponge? It's probably a dead sponge. Okay. <laughs> It's shaped perfectly like a rock. But it's probably, yeah, a dead sponge. Especially because there's a dead sponge, like, right there. This can be a rock also. It looks too solid for a sponge. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it would be anything, it would definitely be a pumice. Looks like a rock. Whoa, look at that. Is that a dead sponge? Dead sponge, too? that's the dead sponge. Yeah, so I guess this pumice found its way by this volcanic seamount. Basically, pumice is volcanic ash, mm -hmm. and it must have traveled from somewhere and then got waterlogged and just sunk. Because usually pumice can float on water. Okay. Yeah. So, float on water, right? And Dr. Val explained to me that, like, when she opened, saw one of those open, mm -hmm. a lot of water just like came out of the pores. So, it, it, that's that's what I would probably expect if we were to collect that. Yeah, and the sea star, the red one that we were looking at on the, the sea color. floor. So, looks like in the family uh, Zoroasteridae can be the genus Zoroaster. That looks, that looks exactly it. <laughs> Great job. It always impresses me how fast y'all ID. Do majority of your biology classes that you've taken, have you noticed that most of it is memorization? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Because I've heard that, like, biology is like, oh, yeah, oh, memorization. No. no, actually it's not. And because I'm somebody who's very bad at uh, memorizing, I cannot. That's not true. <laughs> it is. Like, <laughs> like, I need patterns. I need patterns. Yeah, and, yeah, And, yeah. uh, like, <laughs> when I'm studying something, I cannot memorize. That's not how I study. So, no. Okay. But... There's this reasons why things are named a certain way. So all the taxonomic names have uh, something to do with how they look, their structures, what group they belong to. So it is not just names. It's uh, there. Uh, there's a intricate logic that goes behind naming organisms. 
so and is that is because I've worked on this so much you just get a practice out of it but so what's an example of a sea star is like the most thing that I'm like yeah okay, the that's asteroid <laughs> asteroid so okay like that so this this it's Latin right so you have to look at the root words what they mean so they have unless it's named after people after places they have been they were first discovered in Echinoderms. So echinus means uh, thorny or spiny. So they have oh. dorm is skin or the uh, dermata. So the outer layer of tissue. So you have spiny skin, echinoderma. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think there's other facets as well, like understanding the um, how the sea star moves and exactly. senses the environment. So there's the water vascular the system. system yeah. And then you can do like comparative anatomy and compare that amongst different organisms. And you can understand their behavior. So there's a lot of different facets of um, biology that isn't just memorizing species, but kind of understanding them in many different levels. Yeah, so Ashana just left and we were talking about uh, naming of if biology is memorization or just, because uh, usually I've heard that biology is like memorization of all the stuff. I wouldn't see it anything but. Well, what was the other option? Ashana was explaining that it's not. It's a lot of patterns and uh, the names oh. mean something. That makes sense. And so when you look at like econoderms, econo, she was saying means spiky on uh, the skin like layer and so I was like okay so you have to know lat to I, I well that was my follow-up question yeah. I was gonna be like oh so do you suggest like biologists learning Latin I think so we used to actually I used to work at um, a center where we would take kids out snorkeling and have them like look at different creatures in the environment and the goal like not the major goal but one of the amazing things was um, sometimes by the end, if they were one of the groups that stayed with us a little bit longer during their field trip program, they could they could already be like, that's an echinoderm, that's a, you know, whatever, yeah. that's an idarian or something like that. So I think the terms can be pretty, they can be kind of like overwhelming in the beginning, but like once you get a general idea of like, okay, like nidarians include corals, jellyfish, anemones, echinoderms are sea urchins, sea stars. Uh, sea cucumbers you kind of like know the the general categories and then there's all sorts of like really rare categories that are harder to know and that's like you know we have specialists for that but yeah that's what i was gonna also ask so i remember in bio 2 we would learn like econoderms and just like the basics of it but for masters or like upper level biology do you like pick a specific breed that you not breed, but like species that you want to specialize in? Is that like how you specialize for your graduate school? I think, yeah, that's a good question. I think there's just so many different types of biology too. So someone might, someone might specialize just understanding, you know, how do sea stars sense their environment? How do they find food? Do they smell it through the water? Can they, not the sea stars in the deep probably seeing light, but in the shallows, yeah. can they see light? Um, and then uh, some might be like comparing different sea stars from different regions, right? And like seeing how their anatomy is different or some might be looking at specific genes and like how they're expressed in like stressful environments. So if they're, if, you know, climate change is getting worse, as we know, and they're in these warm waters, how is that going to affect their behavior, their gene expression, stuff like that. So there's so many different ways. And a lot of times it might not even be species focused as much as it is question focused on like that particular theme, like climate change or anatomy or behavior or ecology, um, understanding the interactions, right? So yeah, I think um, people do definitely in their grad school journeys um, kind of explore and see different topics and maybe they also specialize into certain labs that um, really focus on you know just jellyfish or mm -hmm. <laughs> just just this one species of plant um, but other labs they might even span um, 
different habitats even, like coral reef, terrestrial, things like that. So, um, yeah, there's Carol, definitely... Sorry. I have a question for you before you leave us. <laughs> yeah, sorry if that's a long I, answer. No, mm -hmm. I just, I'm very curious, is, is this classification system universal? Do all countries follow this or do they have their own kind of classification systems? Right, yeah, and I think that's a really interesting um, other like dimension to this, right? So I guess scientists try to standardize things so they know they're all, all on the same page, like we're talking about the same thing. So generally, um, if you're, class you're a classically trained scientist, I guess you would be like, oh yeah, the kind of germs, I know what that is. We're all following this um, phylum Tax taxonomy, basically, but if um, you're talking about other ways of thinking about groupings of species, um, um, in other cultures, right, um, I think there could be different categorizations of things. Um, for example, um, in Guam, there's like a specific word for um, tape grass, a type of seagrass, and that's low. And then there's another word for um, general, like green plants in the water, right? And then they have their own kind of classifications as well. And then you, it's important to take that into account when you're, maybe if you're asking for, you know, um, oral traditions and asking people like, how has this area changed? You want to keep in mind that their language and their classifications don't necessarily fit into scientific classifications and everywhere has their own different languages right i forget which country it was but i went to a, a seagrass conference and um they said they it was hard for them to study seagrass because they didn't actually have a word for it that that tar particular type so they couldn't ask people about it so as a community they came together and made a word for wow. it which was so um interesting right like kind of this evolution of naming um, in a cultural sense. So, right, yeah, right. I think it's that's a very interesting question. Thanks for answering it. Yeah, mm -hmm. do you have anything to add to that? Feel free, <laughs> that's oh, just my I, Yeah, I was just curious because I'm not of biology. Um, that's not my background. Right. So I'm just curious if there was kind of a standardized system across right, you know, yeah. the, the, the science world. Yeah, for sure, like the, the system we've been using is like the most common. Mm -hmm. Um, standardized Latin-based system, yeah. But there are other things yes, out there. absolutely. And with that, I'll, head, I'll um, give back this seat to Tori. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, thank Carol. you, Carol. Yeah, thanks for having me in your watch for a little bit. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your dive. So, Derek, uh, we're gonna be recovering at eight. So, for 14, what's what's our ascent rate? Thirty meters a minute? Um, no. more like. 20, 25. Okay, so we probably want to leave the bottom like around 645. 630. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, 645. Okay, yeah, so we've got about 45 minutes left. Um, so no major shocking change in the plan, just meander our way to waypoint 10, see what we find, and come up from there. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. You know, it's a, it's. I'm really glad that I was here to be able to confirm all that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we can spend that time. I mean. Yeah. yeah. yeah I was trying to not to rush to that waypoint because once we're there, it's probably sort of downhill around it. Yeah, it's all downhill from there. <laughs>
Welcome back, Tori. <laughs> Thank you. Were you able to be here for the rock sample? Yeah. She yeah? came in once we had it in, in, in our claws, oh. and uh, she, she approved of it, thankfully. Yeah. Nice. Were you in here for it? Yeah, yeah, I, I picked it. Yeah, I did happen <laughs> to lose that one, though. Yeah, we grabbed did it. You it. lost it? I didn't yeah. lose it. <laughs> what? Well, what did you get? Much, I uh, must have gotten an inferior sample. I don't know. I don't know. It looked well, pretty good to me. I, I have to say, it looked good to me, but I was really excited about your sample, too. <laughs> it was really sad. Yeah, <laughs> it was, was very like, sad. I was, was like, oh, I, I it's dropped gone. It. It's gone. And you didn't even look for it? No. <laughs> I was like, okay, there's one well, right there. Well, we're never going to know what minerals are inside that rock. No, we aren't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no clue. I was excited about that. that one, too. Yeah, I was excited. <laughs> Man. <but> Man. Okay. <laughs> I, I debated not even telling you. I was just going to let you believe. <laughs> The whole time that uh, it was yours. I'm going to stand up on the deck watching you with the rocks. I'm like, where's my sample? Where's my sample? And I would, I would probably pick it up and be like, this like, is oh, it. Where you are. Where is this? I'm like, that's not it. No, no, no. I haven't got pictures of it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have to hold those pictures close. Yeah. That's because it's the only thing we have left to remember it by. Uh -huh. Pahaku. Okay. Pahaku. Right? Pahaku. <laughs> Pahaku. Can we please track a line bearing 350 <laughs> at 0 0.2 you. knots? I wasn't. I really was not going to tell you. Thank you. Oh, man. That's okay. It, it, it returned to its um, pile of rock friends. I know. I thought when he lost it, I was like, I hope it didn't hit any organisms on the way down. <laughs> there, w there wasn't anything. It was like, you know, like this. That, there wasn't anything oh, okay, much there. It was okay. all stuff that was on the rocks. Okay, cool. I'm sure they're all fine. Thankfully, if you put a rock back not exactly where it was, it, it's fine. It might get manganese coating on a different part of it, though. Yeah. Because it was a, there was a not black part. Yeah, I'm okay. excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you were. But the one that we picked up did have did that, that same okay. color. Well, then not as beautiful as the one you had, obviously. It's, it's probably similar, honestly. Now, honestly, if it's not similar, then, you know, I mean, we're trying to pick stuff that's representative because we don't have a rock hammer down here, you know, so. Yeah. What is this in the Atalanta cam? Uh, it looks like jelly. a jelly. Yeah. yeah. That literally looks like a jelly. It looks like a star. A firework. Yeah. You know, that's a better word. <laughs> Speaking of stars, I need to try to remember to go up on the monkey deck today. Oh, oh hey. Is this a, I don't know if that's a puhi. It looks like just a fish. That was a fish that we saw earlier. Yeah, it's um, not a trying to oh, remember the big blue name. eyes. This is a smaller one though. I think. He's going after the lasers like a cat. This is one that has the whiskers, yeah? Bonk. Oh. See, you can't see. It's too light. Or it's too bright, I mean. Bonk. Bonk. <laughs> Bonk. Was that rock sample maybe the last sample we'll take? Is there like more uh, niskins? Yeah, I mean, we, we'll probably do a niskin at the top of the, at waypoint 10. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we'll just see if, if things look different there. We may um, look at something else, but um, the only plan is to do one last niskin up there. I mean, if we see a rock up there and it looks cool, why not, <laughs> if we have the space. But also, We're if it's not, it's okay. If we, we don't find We probably it, have okay. um, more space in, like this is probably the least number we've done per, on, a, on a dive yet, because typically we're pretty full, but I think we're probably we're we're like half full. Yeah, we're very empty. That's oh, right, I mean, we, we haven't, this hasn't had the sort of biology diversity that we've had on previous dives, so that, it's totally fine. Yeah, and with the permit, we don't have much to collect anyways. So yeah. even if we did see something new, we'd be unlikely to be able to collect it. Because? We need to see multiples. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't mean a new species, but yeah, understood.
card, is this low bait or sheet flow? I'm guessing I'm sheet. I'm gonna say... I'm gonna say sheet. Well, then I'm gonna say Hold low up. bait. Hold up. I need to see more. There's too, many, too much sediment. If I would have to guess, I would have to say a broken up sheet flow. Mm. Especially looking at that. All that looks super flat. Is that a fish? Oh, there's our fish friend again. Yeah. There, and there's a sea star. It took me so long to stop calling them starfish. I still say jellyfish. I know they're not fish. Wait, we can't say jellyfish anymore? Not supposed to. It's, it's not fish. just jellies. Or sea jellies. Yeah, I prefer they, jellies. It's easier up to say. They filed a complaint. <laughs> yeah. They're like, hey, wait a minute. And then, yeah, sea star instead of starfish, because they're also not fish. Fish is hiding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was leaving for dinner, Sebastian had noticed something hiding. Was that a fish? Or was I it believe that was a fish. Okay, I didn't get to stay in here. We didn't really see the full body. We just saw the head very briefly, but look like a fish. I thought you said it was a crab. No? Okay. I wonder how many fish there I are hiding that all over the place. Oh, we have so many bright lights. Probably swim away. So is this the summit of the seamount or just somewhere very high on the seamount uh, compared Oh, I guess we are kind of. We're, we're, we are on that last isobath, but um, we'll see if it, it might go up a little bit more before waypoint time. I don't think any sharks were seen on this uh, dive. Nope. I did see a pumice. A pumice. A singular one. Someone saw a uh, manganese covered um, beaked whale bone at the very beginning. What? Of this dive? <laughs> yeah. Whoa, how did I miss that? It was very early on. It was literally the first shift. Not a lot of people talked about it. No. It was a good rock. It was. Sea H two thousand five. I forgot to bring my notebook, so I have to just email myself. Twenty five oh nine. If this was an RPG, there would be a boss battle here. <laughs> there totally would. <laughs> 